Thank you, and God bless you, and may God bless them. So, on to our sermon series. We're about to round a corner. So up to this point in the book of Acts, which is the book that we have been going through, for those of you who might not know, the book of Acts is called the Acts of the Holy Spirit because it is the book that is written after the account of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, who came to earth, taught, was crucified, was raised from the dead for the forgiveness of sins, who ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of the Father to judge the living and the dead. So... What happens after he ascends? And the master is taken up into heaven. And when the, at that time, it was a master pupil relationship that when Jesus said, take the boat to the other side of the river, no one like questioned and said, what does that mean? How do I interpret that? You know, they just did it. And so after Jesus ascends into heaven, the church takes on a new ecclesiastical structure that now we have a group of apostles who are leading the church we have shared leadership and what's really exciting is how the church starts spreading out into the world and how it does that and up to this point the account has been more or less centered around the home church so they have undergone the persecutions, the trials, the tribulations, all the times when they would go to the temple and preach, and the, and the, the people who rejected the Messiah said, we, we reject you and we will persecute you even to the point of death. In the home church, we've seen people martyred. We've seen the church scattered. We've seen miracles And we have seen division inside the church as people start arguing about how things are supposed to be. And we've seen God overcome all these obstacles. And it's been focused on Jerusalem and Antioch. And it has been the ministry to the Jews by and large. That it was just a little bit ago when we talked about how God opened the doorway to all people of all nations of all culture, that it was no longer the religion of the Jews. It became the religion for all people. Praise God. What what an amazing blessing that is. And we talked about these things, and I think by and large it's because you have to square away in before you can square away out. That you've got to take care of home before you start helping your neighbor. And Jesus taught this a little bit when he said, you know, like, Hey, be careful that you're trying to remove the plank out of your brother or the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a plank in your own eye. If we as a church body are going to say we're going to be about evangelism, we're going to be about outreach, we're going to be about, you know, reaching the, the lost and sending out missions, but if HQ is a mess, what are we bringing them into? So you have to square away in before you can square away out. And so the shift occurs. Jerusalem, Antioch, we've gone through it. They've gone through their struggles. They're forming their identity. Years have passed. The leadership has begun growing, pouring into second generation leaders. All these things are happening. And the shift occurs. From the church being dynamic to daring, as uh, a commentator named Wearsby puts it that we're going from a church that is growing into dynamic to a church that is growing to become daring. And it's such a wonderful and beautiful shift to watch the Holy Spirit who is ready to move out and do wondrous things in the surrounding communities. So if you have your Bibles, which I hope that you do, I say that every Sunday, and my hope is that you would start bringing your Bibles to church If you don't have a Bible, we got stacks of them. We'll give you two. (laughs) You know, so that you've got one to give away to your neighbor and friend, you know? Like, if you don't have a Bible, um, don't worry about it. Just come talk to anybody. Like, we got a whole pile of them in the back. We got piles of them in my office. And what what an amazing blessing that is, that we have an abundance of God's Word, that we can say, hey, you need a Bible? Take two. It's not like that everywhere. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to chapter 13. And that's where we're going. 
And for everyone who's got it open to Acts, and they're like, geez, buddy, like, where in Acts? <laughs> Acts chapter 13. And so this is, we're going to be going through a couple chapters. So I'm not going to read all of it. We're going to be filling some things in. But I'm going to kind of give you the things that I have sort of highlighted as these are the, the things that we're going to focus on. And so why they put it where they did, we're going to go up to, it's actually 1225 is where we'll start. But when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, which is going from Antioch to Jerusalem with food and gifts so that they could take care of the famine, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, I like this guy, Manian. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but I'm pronouncing how I like to pronounce it, Manian. Man's man. <laughs> Who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Sit apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So this is the beginning of one of the greatest tales of a great missionary, Saul, also called Paul who is now commissioned by the Holy Spirit to go and be an evangelist and fulfill the role that was given to him at his conversion. Which to go back to that, remember how he said, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name, for I have made him my representative to the Gentiles. And this is really important as we're going to loop around to it, that Paul has a purpose. Paul has a mission. And the Holy Spirit commissioned him. And the church laid hands on him. And they sent him off. And I'm really excited because I have some maps for you. That as we start talking about these places, I thought, gosh, how nice it would be for you to kind of get a, a little handle on things. So I started with this one because what we have up here in this little corner is we see that we're really in our box around what is Israel and modern-day Turkey. And next slide, please. And so this is just a much better map to tell you so that you can see, like, where they're going and what they're doing. So when I say that they sailed to the island of Cyprus, you now don't have to, like, huh, I wonder where that is. That That's the island Cyprus there. And so they go from Antioch to Seleucia, where then they depart, and they begin their missionary and work in the island of Cyprus. And they go to Barnabas's home island. And I've always thought that was interesting that when they say, well, where should we start this mission? Like, and Barnabas goes, let's, you know, like, I know a people group. And it's always a pleasure to minister to your hometown. I'm just telling you that. So they go, and in Salamis, they preach the word of God and it is successful, and then they go to the other end of the island. And so in Paphos is where they find their first encounter with opposition. That it says that they go, and they're preaching the word, and that the ruling, the ruling guy, he wants to hear him. The proconsul, he says, bring him to me. I want to hear this message. I'm intrigued. I'm interested. This is something I want to know about. And so when they get there, they find a sorcerer. And his name is Bar-Jesus, and they called him uh, Eliamis, which means sorcerer. And he's the proconsul's aide. He's the guy who has the ear of this proconsul. And as they're preaching the gospel, this Bar-Jesus fellow, he starts opposing them. And he starts saying, you don't need to listen to these people. He's contradicting them, and he has his black magic to kind of back up his claims as who he is. He says he opposed them and he tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elamius and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. 
You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. And immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about. Someone led him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So this first opposition, Peter, or Paul, excuse me, filled with the Holy Spirit, looks straight at him and says, you're an enemy of God? How dare you get between this man and the faith? And a miracle happened. So then they go to Pisidian Antioch, and along the way, they get to Perga, which is right up there. They go from Paphos, which is on the island. They go to mainland Turkey and in Persia. That's where John Mark says, hey, this is getting too real. I'm out of here. We don't have any details. It just says that John Mark departed. So this person, after a couple of, of missionary endeavors, he says, man, like, peace out, bean sprouts. I can't, <laughs> I, I'm not into this, man. And he sails back home. And we don't know why. It just says that it happened. So John Mark hits the road, says, I've, I'm tapping out. And so they go to Pisidian Antioch, and this is where I find it really interesting because they start preaching in these synagogues, and they're invited to come and speak. So they go, and they preach this amazing message. And the synagogue, which was like kind of the, the Jewish place of worship, they're like, wow, this is incredible. This is really good. This guest speaker is really something. And they follow him out, and they say, hey, bud, can you come back next week? You know, like, come back, keep teaching. We, we, we're, we're eating this up. We like it. And so Paul Barnum is like, yeah, sure, that's what we're here for, you know? So, but all week, they're still out preaching the word. Well, the next week rolls around, and it says a huge crowd comes to hear Paul and Barnabas give the gospel message. And what happens is the church the synagogue that they were at got jealous because they saw the crowds and they got jealous and they hatch a plan. They hatch a plan and they say, we are going to turn the people against these men. So, Paul is giving a speech and this is where he finds the heart of his message. And he says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. A justification you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophet said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish. For I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe even if someone told you. Well, that didn't sit well with half of them. One half said, this is incredible, this is amazing, I need Jesus in my life. The other half said, we need to kill these guys. Pretty, pretty stark difference there, you know? I mean, that kind of goes from zero to 60. But... This amazing thing happens. They begin to publicly argue with Paul. So Paul rebukes them. He continues to preach to the Gentiles. And the word of God spreads so much. The Jews get together and they rile up the people. So the missionaries shook the dust off their robes and they hit the road. And it says, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So they go on to Iconium. They go up from Persidian Antioch, they head west to Iconium, and they preach, they perform miracles, they preach boldly because there was so much opposition. And that's what I really like, that if you read it and you start critically looking at it, it says, they preached boldly because there was so much opposition. Like, when the people were like, mm, 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 I don't like it, Paul and Barnabas doubled down. <laughs> hey, but you need to hear it. So they're preaching, and it's bold, and it's bearing fruit. They're, through miracles, they're able to show that they are the real deal. And just like in Pisidian Antioch, the town gets divided. Like Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace. I came with a sword 
to divide people, to separate them. And the losing half hatch a plan to persecute them, which is going to be a recurring theme as time goes on. And the word got out, they moved on, and they moved from Iconium, they went down to Lystra, where they heal a lame man, and the people thought they were gods. They go, and, and they, they healed a man who was paralyzed, and he's walking around, and the people were like, holy macaroni, these aren't men. Like, these are the gods Zeus and Hermes, because men can't do this stuff. So they bring bulls, and they're having this big party, and they're going to sacrifice to them. And Paul and Barnabas rip their clothes like, no, 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 we're not gods, we're not gods, we're not gods, don't do this, don't do this. And even with them telling them, we're not gods, the people were like, oh, you can't fool us, you gods. <laughs> like, I like how you're trying to test our faith, you know, we're like, that's something only a god would do. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 no. And so... They kind of calm them down, and right when they get them calmed down and ready, ready to start really preaching to them, a group follows them from Pisidian Antioch, follows them down to capitalize when they look and they see these people like, these are gods, and the, the people who have followed Paul to, to screw them up, like, oh, this is too good. And they fan those flames and they start really stirring up this mess and this muck. And and they keep preaching the gospel. And what happens next is Paul gets drug out of town and they throw stones at him until they're sure he's dead. That's what happened. They drag him out of town and they throw rocks at him until they think he's dead and then they leave. <laughs> Problem solved. Well, some disciples came and it says they surrounded Paul and Paul was then able to get up and what does he do? He goes back into the city. He does what? He goes back into the city. Like, God bless that man. You know? I mean, I get discouraged when my internet's out. <laughs> you know? Like, and he goes back. But he doesn't stay. He goes on. And he goes to Derby, where he preaches the word. Derby is over just a little bit to the west. And so then, this is where our chunk of scripture concludes. As they preached the gospel in that city, and they won a large number of disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting, a big couple of words, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and from Italia they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work that they had completed. And on arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he'd opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So that's what happens. The Holy Spirit sends out Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. They're not the first missionaries sent out. Like it says that when they go, there's already disciples there. So they're not the first missionaries to get sent out, but they're the ones that we really get to see. They're not the first to preach Jesus to the Gentiles, but they're commissioned by God to have a mission. They become a central part of the early growing church. And we can find some big takeaways from their experiences. Here's some of the big takeaways. It starts with this. That the Holy Spirit is the one who sends and propels missionaries. 
It doesn't say that Paul and Barnabas had an idea. Paul and Barnabas were reading Torah and they said, you know what, I think we should go do this. It says they were commissioned by God. And the Holy Spirit is the one that says, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. And the disciples are living in the joy of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's really a central component to all this, enough that I would say if you're reading this and you're looking for what Paul is doing, you're missing it. We don't read this and say what Paul and Barnabas is doing. Let's look at this and see what the Holy Spirit of the living God is doing. Because Paul and Barnabas, their bones are resting with their ancestors. But the Holy Spirit's alive and with us today. Still active, still working, still moving, still commissioning, still sending, still propelling ministry. And I love it. This says, after prayer and fasting, because they're praying, they're fasting, and the Holy Spirit says, this is what I want to do. And it doesn't say they jumped up and off they went. It says, when they had finished praying and fasting, then they commissioned them. They laid the hands on them and sent them off. Paul didn't watch a documentary and decide to be a missionary. He was called by God and sent out, filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is where it gets really important because they're practicing spiritual disciplines. It didn't say that Paul was out there just hanging out, not engaged, not engaged with the church, not engaged with prayer, and not engaged with God, and he's out working on a tent, and then the Holy Spirit opens the clouds and says, hey, have I got a deal for you? And like, yes, God. They're praying. They're fasting. They are practicing spiritual disciplines and they're doing it as a group. And a lot of the time, the group gets lost. And we don't focus on what the group accomplishes because we're so enamored with the miracles performed by the one that we lose sight that it wasn't Paul and Barnabas doing this all by themselves. They were a part of the group, and the group are the ones who laid hands on them and sent them off. And when they return on their way back and they're setting up elders in these churches, what are they doing? They're praying and they're fasting. They're engaged in spiritual disciplines through their whole experience. And I say it again, they were sent out by a church. They laid their hands on them and commissioned them. And it's so important because they're not acting alone. There's a group of people praying for them as they're out. They have prayers and support of a praying congregation. Showing us that there are senders and there are goers. I'm a sender. I, I have no calling in my life to leave the United States and go be a missionary in a foreign land. I, but I love missionaries. I love missionaries. I love supporting them. I love hearing about what they're doing. I love praying for them. We all have a role. And it might seem odd that in this passage, I was more struck by the personal piety of the missionaries than the miracles that they performed. That I was more impressed by the reliance on God than their dynamic preaching or the content of their message that is necessary for evangelism because I just sort of give you this rundown like Cliff Notes version of what happens. If you want to read some real powerful stuff today when you go home and the kids go down for a nap, crack your Bibles open and read 13 and 14 and you will see amazing things in there that you're going to be like, he didn't even mention this. Go home and read it. But you might be wondering, like, why is it that I'm more impressed by their re reliance on God than any of the other things? They were called by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel while they're practicing spiritual disciplines and sent out from a loving congregation. Why, why is it that our preacher is more focused on that than the amazing things that these people did? Because to me, as I read it, that's a major part of the scriptures. Not what Paul did, but how he did it. 
Because there are things that as we go through this, and for me to be looking at, to preach to you, I have to find something replicable. I have to find something that I can tell you, hey, do this, or know this. But what Paul and Barnabas did was great, and it's amazing. We're seeing the fruits of their labor today. But I'm not Paul. I'm not Barnabas. I'm Evan. Just like you all have a name and a purpose in Christ that is unique to you. So the major takeaways, why I'm more focused on their piety and their practices is because these are the things that are replicable. And how can Paul and Barnabas go and do this in the face of opposition? And it really gets to the core, even beyond these replicable things of fasting and praying and sending people out. There's an even deeper layer. And this is what I really want you to hear, is it has to do with Paul's purpose. Purpose, meaning. I mean, these are things that we as humans struggle with. I mean, like, who am I? That's a, a philosophy 101 question. Who are you? What's in your core? And then the next thing is, what's my purpose? What's my meaning? Uh, I read secular articles and people in living lives of quiet desperation as they do all the things that they think they need to do. They, they go to college, and they get the degree that makes their parents proud, and then they go to work, and then they have this nice job, and then they have this, you know, the American dream realized. And they're not happy. Why aren't they happy? <laughs> they should be happy. Because what's the purpose? What's the meaning? And as we, we go out, and half of us are just struggling to survive right now. So, you know, we don't have a lot of, it can be a blessing because we don't have a lot of philosophical time. <laughs> you know, when you're just trying to put food on the table, like, who am I? You know, that doesn't really enter into that equation. But it's this idea that you have a meaning and a purpose. And what is it? Because you all have it, whether you know it or not. You have all put something in your mind as this is my reason for existing. And it's man's search for meaning. Because Paul faced opposition at every turn. Everywhere he went, someone opposed him. Everywhere he went, there was pushback. He didn't just go to all the places that were super receptive. They drug him out of town and threw rocks at him until they thought he was dead. How can Paul withstand the punishment and hardships with so much grace that when you read the letters that he wrote, they're not bitter. They're not angry. They're not... Him saying, and then I went to this town and they threw rocks at me till they thought I was dead and I'm waiting for the Romans to beat them down. Like, you know, that's not what the contents of his writings are. He's like, love, grace, mercy. How can he handle it with so much grace? It's because Paul knew his purpose. He knew his reason for existing. His reason to exist wasn't to pursue creature comforts. His reason for existing wasn't to avoid hardship. His reason to exist was beyond the realm of physical comfort, power, prestige, and wealth. His reason for existence, his purpose was to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And no matter what happened to him, he stayed on mission. And this is really vital and important. I'll share with you that there was a time in my wife and I's life when we were going through intense, intense personal tragedy. 
I'll spare you a lot of the details, but we didn't know whether or not we were going to get to be parents. See? Like, to this day, it, like, it's hard for me to talk about, but we went through it for years. Years. And one day we were in the car, and my wife says, you want to talk about babies? And I'm like, not really. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, and she says, do you even want kids anymore? Because we had been just hammered on it. And I said, well, you know, I guess if it happens, it happens. But if you want to know the truth, where where I've been handling this is I just focus on mission. She says, what? I said, well, I'm pastoring a church. You know, our youth group has gone from 3 to 40. Church has gone from 30 to 70. I have a lot to focus on. I don't worry about these things. I just focus on mission. And that's what got me through, was able to say that whether I have children or not doesn't change what I'm supposed to be doing with my life, which is building up the kingdom of God. Whether I live or die, my mission remains the same. Whether I am in plenty or in want, my mission remains the same. Whether I am here or there, whether I am healthy or sick, Whatever it is, my mission and my purpose. I know what God has called me to do, and it has been my anchor. And I'm not telling you this to go, and what a great guy I am. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. What I'm trying to tell you, what's your purpose? What's God called you to do? Who has God called you to be? Is your purpose creature comforts? Is your purpose nothing more than raising your children in a way that when they leave the house, you're going to feel empty inside and not, not know what to do? What's your purpose? Because if your purpose isn't the church, and I don't mean the church like you need to be down here volunteering every night. Like that... I like creature comforts. I like raising my kids. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not saying that you have to abandon something. What I'm saying is you need to know what your life's about and what's going to happen whether you're in stormy weather or you're in good weather, whether you're in sickness or you're in health, whether whatever is going on around you, what's your mission? What's your purpose? Because when you go out in the spirit of the living God, you will see miracles. Like people say, I wish I could see God work in a mighty powerful way. Find your purpose and run. Find your purpose and go and you will find satisfaction because no matter what happens at you, when you see this mission come to fruition, when you start seeing the things that God does, you'll be amazed. And whether you're living in a mansion or a shack, it won't matter because you'll know what's important. And so right now, let's say you're going, all right, you talked me into it. (laughs) Okay. Now what? I'm ready. Now what? So here's what to do. This is where I said those two big words, prayer and fasting. How much time a week do we spend in spiritual disciplines? How much time a week do we spend seeking the Lord's will for our lives? How much time a week do we spend in the word? How much time a week do we set aside? And I sometimes kind of wish that every week our streaming services had a little clock that they would tell us how much time we spent watching television just to help us put things in perspective. We have the time. But like Joel said, where your heart and your treasure are, what's important? So, if you want to find your purpose, if you want to find your reason to exist, The directions are in here. 
This is the, this is the owner and operator's manual. If you want to know and say, God, why, why? Huh. He wrote it down. <laughs> and you discover it through prayer and fasting and seeking the Lord while he can be found. Like this isn't some sort of mystical, like uh, uh, magic formula. It's a process. And it comes down to the idea that God wants a relationship from you. God just likes spending time with you. Prayer, fasting, the word. It's a quiet time with God. Or if you like me, you like loud time with God. And when we know what we're doing, and we know that we exist to bring glory to God, that we exist to grow, the mission goes on. Let's take Paul's missionary journey to heart. We read about a man who is called by God for a purpose. What has God called you to do? Do you know? Have you ever thought about it? What's your gifting? What's your calling? How are you living for the mission? This is a central question that we who call ourselves disciples of Christ need to ask. What are we created to accomplish? And what's my role in God's mission to make disciples? And if you don't know, I challenge you. If I'm asking you these things and you're like, oh, geez, I don't know. I challenge you to engage the word in prayer and fasting. Seek the Lord's will for your life. Ask God for a spiritual experience. Ask God to show you who you are. We serve a living God. He is not stagnant. He is not inaccessible. He wants to answer these questions. So if you don't know, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. So, once you find your purpose and you found it, then you too will be able to be beaten, abused, hurt, rejected, face death, and consider it pure joy. <laughs> Some deal. <laughs> but there's that word at the end. Pure joy. And that's the peace that most of us are at home living lives of quiet desperation. And we would face those things all day long if it meant that at night we closed our eyes and felt joy in our hearts. Because you will know that you are fulfilling your purpose and advancing the mission of God. So before we close in prayer,